Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy the podcast series, um, did you know you can extend your love and buy us a coffee? You go to buymeacoffee.com and search for Journal of Biophilic Design. Uh, your company can also sponsor a podcast and let me know if you'd like to. We reach over 20,000 listeners a month. Obviously, it shows that Biophilic Design has an amazing following and all the wonderful people, just like you, dear listener. Um, do check out our really beautifully printed and ebook copies of the journal itself. And each issue has a different theme. Look out for the Cities edition, as well as our issues on home, workplace and healthcare. You can buy directly from our website or from Amazon. And we're really um, pleased to be joined by one of our contributors <laughs> who's uh, just written an amazing article for us, uh, Jamie Blakely Glover. Um, he's also going to be speaking at the fantastic Workplace Trends Conference on the 19th of April uh, 2023 in London. Um, there's going to be a link uh, to the spiel that accompanies this podcast. Um, Jamie, first of all, many thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, Ness. Nice to see you. And you. Um, can you tell us what you'll be speaking about? Maybe we can sort of kick off the podcast that way around. So I'm speaking with a colleague, Dr. John Rhodes. So John's uh, a, a doctor of applied psychology at Plymouth Uni. I've been working with him and uh, a few others over the last few years. So what we're speaking about is um, looking at what a human centric transformation around sustainability would look like in the workplace. So it really kind of builds together three bits of research that we've done independently and collectively over the last couple of years. So it really started around some kind of big stats that so many organisations are setting these big targets, having these big strategies, and then just not hitting them. So the first bit of research was kind of, well, what's going on? So we started to, to look at the sort of factors, and a lot of those were human. Yeah. So then the next bit was, okay, well, if a lot of this change is human, then what do we need to do about that? So um, I'll be presenting the most sustainable workplace index, which I've developed to, to measure the kind of human dimension around sustainability in the workplace. Um, and then the final bit is a research program that we've been running um, is being peer reviewed at the moment, the first paper from it, where we looked at a more information led approach uh, to working on climate in the workplace in terms of carbon literacy against a more psychology coaching led approach, um, which provided some great results. So we'll be presenting those. Wow, amazing. Well, we're going to be there. So Journal of Biofit Design will be at the Workplace Trends with Jamie Blakely Glover and his colleague, Dr. John Rhodes, um, and many, many other speakers. So if you haven't heard about Workplace Trends, make sure you go and have a Google. I'll put a link, as I said, on the spiel um, and do follow them on social media because they're always posting some really interesting um, past talks, actually, that you can watch. So anyway, before we launch into the whole thing, Jamie, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, your company is Orientate, and uh, I love your website address. It's orientate.earth, which I think is lovely. Can you tell us a little bit about that and about what you got you into this journey? Yeah, absolutely. So I know Orientate I guess it's been going in some form for about three or four years now, Um and where it's kind of coming from is, I guess, there's so many of these kind of crises that are facing humanity, whether it's climate, biodiversity loss, social justice. And I guess my, my sense is that there's a lot of recognition on one level of those big things that we've got to grapple with. Um, so there's a, a lot of kind of good intent. But I think quite often what that's not flowing through to is actually kind of action and we're not really internalising those things and, and adapting how we work. So my sense is we're kind of stuck in this kind of in-betweenness of knowing kind of where we need to get to, but not really doing what we need to do to get there. So that's the place that um, we designed Orientate to sit in ultimately. Um, so that is a space of transformation, adaptation, and what we do is a, a blend of consultancy, coaching, largely focused on the workplace, uh, organizational change, um, and specifically within the built environment. So there's a few different bits to the business. Um, there's the most sustainable workplace index, which I think we're going to chat about a bit later, um, which is designed to, to measure, uh, it's a human centric measure of sustainability within the workplace. Um, and then, so that's kind of like, well, where are we within the organizations on this stuff? And then the other bit is then what do we do about it? So um, there's a number of really exciting um, collaborations I'm involved with. So I love doing that because it's it just brings diversity and different kind of mindsets. And it's people who are working together because we want to and we we care about the same thing. So um, 
There's one called Regrand, which is with a fantastic Bath-based business called Futureground. Um, so that's about taking this sort of thinking into the property industry and the built environment. Um, I've got a collaboration called Earth uh, with um, a number of other coaches and facilitators. So we're based down on a farm uh, just south of Bristol. So that's a kind of nature-based co-working space. And we support each other, run programs together. Um, and that was really about, I guess, probably from a biophilia perspective, we wanted to actually say, well, what happens if we do actually go and work in a nature-based location a couple of days a week and see what that does in terms of changing it? Um, and then the final one is is the climate coaches. So um, as I mentioned, that's that's the one I'm involved with, John. On um, so we've been working on this kind of research approach to try and build the evidence based about a more kind of coaching psychology led approach. So yeah, and it's 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 busy. It's yeah. but it's diverse and a, a lovely kind of way to work. It sounds lovely. Um, can I can I ask you what it is like? And you, I mean, I, I presume you sometime you might write a study, or maybe I can encourage you to write a piece for our journal. Actually, that would be really great. Maybe actually for the next one because it's about creativity, our next issue. Um, but how how do you find the, or how do people find working in a farm <laughs> on a farm environment? Yeah, it's um, it's been brilliant actually. So I mean, it's been really interesting being over the winter. So we've got a couple of yurts there that we work in when it's cold. Uh, and then we've got a, a kind of barn where we've converted it into a kind of co-working space when it's less cold. But I think <laughs> what's lovely is trying to unplug. So making sure within the day that we we create space for going for a walk, slowing down, that we make space for kind of more dialogue, reflection, um, thinking about things, taking inspiration, what's going on around us. And it, it does definitely promote I think a, a different way of thinking um and I, I swear and it was pretty remarkable being there over the winter because you're just going through all these amazing changes around you and I think you can't help but be inspired once you start to kind of connect with those things a bit more so I think it's, for me it's definitely meant I am more connected to what's going on around me because I'm showing up there every week that's beautiful it's, um, it does make a difference. And I think, like you say, living when, when you when you're working in right embedded in season change as well, it also helps you realize because when spring comes that that struggle doesn't always last, does it? So, you know, whatever it is, even if you're working on a little problem at work or a big problem. And then when you come out the other side, it could be a relationship one or anything like that. You come out the other side and actually you know there's always spring around the corner. It always it's, it, it comes in cycles. So um so that's lovely but I do I would like you to write an article so um listeners, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> um can you can you tell us about your your journey what got you into sustainability I know I know you're um, interested in nature anyway but um, what sort of what was your what was your journey into it I guess I'm probably one of my earliest memories probably about eight or nine and I remember doing these projects at school and the one I did one on the rainforest oh wow and I've still got it um, you. <laughs> yeah, I've showed my kids and it Aww. really, it really stuck with me for many, many reasons. And I think that just really piqued an interest. And then when I was probably an early teenager, I remember one of the earliest books I got was this kind of Greenpeace book on environmental issues, which again, I've still got, um, which kind of really engaged me with some of that kind of the, the challenges around it. So I think that those were probably the seeds, I think. Um, I did geography at uni and because I was interested in the world around me um, and how that changes and what that means. Um, and then I kind of ended up going into surveying and I did, again, I kind of gravitated naturally towards the sustainability bit. So kind of in the early 2000s, I did my master's on sustainability within property investment and valuation. But one of the challenges then, which I think is still a challenge now, is like for someone who is kind of going down that route, it's really hard to actually bring sustainability into what you do because the way you're trained is very linear and it's very much like this is how we train you as a surveyor and I kind of had to go down that route um, but then as soon as I got into the workplace I was getting involved with the sustainability work and the corporate social responsibility work and I ended up kind of going to work for the Sustainable Development Commission because I wanted to learn so I got to work with Jonathan Porritt and Will Day and some fantastic wow. people around in, in that experience but it's been a really interesting journey because then after that, I kind of went back to surveying for various reasons and ended up going back into sustainability and ended up becoming head of sustainability at LSH, which should have been an amazing experience. And it was, but 
looking back kind of with older eyes I guess <laughs> I really struggled because I think I felt I had to be this technical expert um to make a difference and whilst I make out the technical stuff I now I don't need to be and also I got really affected by the, I think the culture in the industry at that point because it really wasn't accepting it really it really challenged me so I think kind of after that I almost had to half of me kind of almost had to go away from the industry yeah. before I could come back to it so what that looked like for me was I guess really trying to follow where my energy was mm. so I was really interested in the human side of things and I'd done some work with some climate psychologists at the uh, at the Sustainable Development Commission so I trained and got accredited as a, as a coach and a team coach because I wanted to understand that bit of it and then for me there was also just getting out in nature so I've I qualified as a mountain leader <laughs> So I spend loads of time kind of out in the wilderness on my own and that enabled me to connect with it in my own way. Yeah. Um, so I think the last year or so, I remember I got challenged about a year ago and one of my colleagues at Earth just said, look, you keep talking about your property bit and your nature bit and your kind of coaching human development bit. And they're like, why do you keep doing that? Like, what's this space in the middle? And I was like, yeah, what, what is that space in the middle? Um, because it felt like actually that's kind of me. Um, so that's probably where I've kind of got to now is like, I feel like I understand m my place in all of this madness in terms of kind of this, this space of interconnection between the built environment, the workplace, how we work, bringing kind of nature, living systems into that, but also taking a kind of very human centric approach to it. So yeah, I think that's kind of my journey. It's been quite interesting thinking about it. <laughs> Really, it's this really inspiring. It's an inspiring journey. Um, you say you've gone down the traditional route, as it were. If you like, most people would go into like, well, I go into corporate world and go and do that, and then you've gone off and don't done the thing where you connected to nature and and like you say, what's that space in between? And it's it's you, yeah. <laughs> um, and then realizing and you sort of join joining all the dots up. But you know, it's a really inspiring um career journey. So so thank you for sharing. You were, obviously you said you worked in the property industry, and I, I think you sort of touched on the fact that you know it's a, it's quite a challenging space. Not cha not challenging, but it can be frustrating sometimes. Um, and I know you've mentioned in the, before that um, you know these companies are striving for like these labels, you know, the well building standard, the brand, brand, the, all these things, but they're not. It's not really joined up with the purpose. They kind of they do it because they know they've got to do it, but sometimes maybe the people don't realise why they're doing it. Can you explain a little bit more about, you know, why the purpose thing is really important, uh, maybe to make it all happen, but what's the, um, what, what's your take on that? Again, kind of looking back over the 20 years I've spent working in the property industry, I think for a lot of it, there was kind of this, it was, it was my sense of this disconnection and yeah. I couldn't really put my finger on it and articulate it, but I remember being in meetings I used to do development work and people kind of, you couldn't kind of, people couldn't mention a great crested new or a beautiful old oak tree right. without a kind of macho comment. So there was this kind of thing that I could feel and it was part of the challenge I had, but I couldn't articulate it. And I think some of the writing I've been doing lately has been exploring that. So I think in the context of things like 3M and accreditations, they come from a really good intention space. So I think that's a really important point to honour and there's no getting away from that. I think they are part of the mix. But I think they are a symptom for me of what is a very transactional, largely short-termist industry. So if you think like they're kind of preempting or any accreditation, it's right, well, you do this and you get this. And there's this kind of transaction that allows you to demonstrate this. But the challenge is with that, knowing what I know now, is that that is basically an extrinsic motivator so it's a motivation that's kind of coming from over here somewhere because we want to do this and what that means in terms of the issues with it it's, it's actually quite unstable as a basis for behavior change because we focus on it we attain it and then we kind of as soon as that reward or this is gone we don't do anything with it and it means that we're focusing on this rather than any deeper understanding and knowledge of actually the issues at play and I think that's a kind of real issue. So when I talk about purpose, it's really about the industry taking this stuff that's largely we keep over here and bring it in here 
and thinking about it in terms of meaning, purpose, awareness. And that's largely what we were doing in the research project that I was working on with John and colleagues was looking at actually how you would work with a group of people within two organisations to support them to develop the purpose. Because from that, you can take a little bit of information that turns into knowledge and action and people are committed and they're resilient rather than if you just chuck a bunch of information at them um it there's not a huge amount that goes in and i think as far as the property industry concerned i think one of the real world examples of that there's the bishard review that was done last year i think it was for the rcs and what that and there's that covers a wide range of points but one of the key things was they were saying well actually the rcs as an institution is there for a public benefit yeah. And in many cases, you can kind of sense that actually it's lost its connection with that public benefit and it should be leading on climate and sustainability. And I think we can see the results of that largely kind of transactional short termist approach to the way we work in the industry in the recommendations of that review. Mm -hmm. Because unless we really build it into our purpose, who we are as individuals, teams, organizations, then we will never have the creativity resilience to be able to make progress on this stuff um and it will always be this thing that sits on the shelf so that's kind of my take on it i guess <laughs> yeah you talk about using a river as a metaphor um you know to try and how, how how we can do things differently can you explain what you mean by that yeah so i'm i, lo I love metaphors and i think the, the reason the river works really well is it gives us a sense of energy and the flows of energy. And I think that's why it kind of works for me. So to give you an example, I think sometimes the way we, the way organisations I've seen it, I've been part of it, go, right, okay, we want to do something around sustainability. So we're going to get people to do a training programme or we're going to put a bunch of targets out there. We're going to do a strategy. Within the context of a river basin, that, for me, that's almost the equivalent of going and digging a little pond and filling it up. There's nothing coming in or going out. Whereas I think the way we should be working is thinking about it more about the flow. Because if you look at the stats, and there was a, a research report that came out from the Nudge Unit, I think late last year, early this year. And again, it's the same thing that like nine out of 10 broadly people in the UK want to do more. They want to make more sustainable choices. So to think about that as the rain, as the energy coming into the river basin, and then the role of us within organizations, within those kind of little streams and tributaries is to nurture that motivation. Um, and facilitate kind of that motivation and energy turning into action individually and then working with teams to allow them give them a process to adapt what they do and then that to flow into the kind of river channel which ultimately is the kind of the holder of the organization and I felt it when I was a head of sustainability and I'm sure lots of other heads of sustainability as ESG get this sense sometimes they're kind of pushing water up a hill yeah. um, and I think there's something really beautiful about kind of reconsidering that role or part of that role is about kind of really harvesting the energy and giving it these channels to kind of come through to the organization that's it's a lovely way of looking at it and this is this is what you facilitate as well isn't it so um it's kind of wonderful if, if people want to reach out to you is that okay jamie is, if they yeah want... absolutely uh, and so so particularly as, as uh, my colleague katie does beautiful kind of um yeah kind of days um programs and multi-day programs on rivers i've worked with it and written about it so it's yeah absolutely if you're interested in the approach reach out okay it's fantastic um, it's probably pretty, pretty obvious, but why should we uh, care about our buildings? Why do we need to consider the people who are using them? But when we spoke before, you mentioned the phrase, the social benefit of buildings, which I, I think it's actually, I, I, did that just conjure so many things. You could sort of, you know, you know, people stop, stop the podcast right now, go off and consider that phrase, then return to this podcast and listen to what Jamie's about to say. Because I, I just, I think it's really interesting, the social benefit of buildings. Can you, can you kind of expand on that a little bit and tell us about um, what it is that you're, me, you mean there? We've thought a lot about this. And again, within the context of an industry that is relatively short termist and transactional, I think when we look at buildings, we look at places. Yeah. We have a huge responsibility. Like every one of us working in the built environment, ultimately the, the decisions that we take now, well, the decisions that our predecessors took are influencing our lives now. The decision we take, yeah, whether you think about it immediately within that building, that place, or beyond in terms of the supply chain, will have an effect for years after we've gone. 
So we need to be thinking about our work within that broader context and in terms of that legacy, because you can create amazing or inspiring connected places or you can blight places through kind of the decisions you make. So I think that's where it's coming from. And you talk about the people. So I think we need to look at what the broadest sense of who our stakeholders are. So clearly there's the people who own it and their interest and there is a financial interest which we can't get away from. So it's not undermining that. But we also, yeah, there's the people who work in them, visit them, use them, supply to them, are impacted within what pass them every day now and into the future. So I think taking more of a stakeholder led approach allows us to think about what what place our buildings and our places have in responding to the needs of people both now and in the future. And I think there's some basic stuff that I think we just need to broaden out in terms of how we look at stuff. So, and I've been guilty of it as well because part of the lexicon of the industry is we we talk about units and assets. Like these these are build like these are places people live like and and affects their lives their well being like. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to get beyond that kind of narrow definition. And that's not to say your yield, your rent, your build cost, all those things aren't important, but that's one bit of information. So if we're going to look at social benefit buildings, we need to take that. There's loads of information out there in terms of socioeconomic indicators. But there's also this other kind of warm data that's kind of going on, which is really rich, which is you can only really get by experiencing it yourself, by talking to the people yourself, not paying a consultant to do it. Go and talk to it. Go and sit in that place and look at it. And explore those sorts of things so i think it does point to a shift if we're going to develop and deliver more social benefit of buildings then we need to shift how we work so there's something around how we conceive ourselves so nick and i talk about thinking ourselves as place keepers and letting our decisions flow from that there's something about bringing in different data sets and that creates a different way of knowing buildings a different way of knowing and interacting with places um, and there's some wonderful work I and mean, we're exploring at Earth around kind of warm data and collective imagination. So really ways to, I guess, kind of access this kind of broad sets of information because once we've got that, we can then respond to it. But there's got to be a genuine desire to learn and experience those things ourselves in order to actually kind of respond differently to things. So, yeah, I think it's, it's about a breadth and a depth, I think, for me. Yeah. Place keepers as well as another 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 little gem that I'm taking away. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, this is the journal of biophilic design, and everything that you're saying, just biophilic design, is a, is a key and a solution to so many things. You know why we need life. You know, biophilia is our need for, you know, our, our inherent need to be around life and living things, and and just what you've been saying about referring to buildings and blocks and things as assets and units we forget that actually they are uh, homes or spaces for people to live and work and flourish in. So, um, yeah, maybe we need to just think of a completely different phrase, different term for, <laughs> for what a building is. Maybe we could, uh, you know, turn to the Latin lexicon or something and and um, and, and work, work a word up. But uh, anyway, um, well, for you, I mean, obviously nature is so important and obviously biophilic design um, is, is an important uh, sort of key for everything. But... Why is it important for you um, that we bring uh, nature into our built environment? Obviously, there's empathy um, and the awe rationale, which I, I absolutely love, you know, and the sort of prospect and refuge and things and all these things that encourage sustainable action. If we're surrounded by, you know, memories of nature, even if that's like a wood table or, you know, um, natural materials or sound or, or better lighting and things. Um, you know, can you tell us maybe a little bit about what we can take from, um, you, take, you know, how we can take learnings from the living systems and sort of put them into our um, built environment, environment and how we can build better by, you know, by looking at um, living systems? Yeah, so I think you're, you're right. And, and there's so much there. Um, so probably the first thing comes to me is, is, is why do it? Yeah. And you mentioned kind of all empathy. Um there's a huge amount of evidence out there, as you probably know, and listen to we've written about on the website, and that kind of if if we care about something, we tend to do more to protect it. So 
if we are bringing nature more into our kind of immediate kind of sense of view um, and connecting to it, we we will naturally like right, to do more to protect it. There's a huge amount around well-being and functioning and the role that nature has in 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 that. Um, obviously, stress reduction, creativity. We've talked about. So I think there's a really strong evidence base in terms of why mm. which then for me i guess in my work then takes us to the really interesting bit around living systems which is actually so how do we then bring different ways of thinking into our work so i guess so example so i think the first one is recognizing that we are part of a living system um in cities and i write about this in the article i did for you guys and we are part of a living system in terms of cities in terms of nature like we are part of it so we cannot think about things in a linear way the world is complex so working with living systems allows us to explore that complexity and, and respond to it um living systems are, are wonderfully adaptive so every kind of cycle of life goes through this kind of cycle of birth growth death and i think but the key thing about it is it's in response to its surroundings and I think that's really, really important, whether it's about designing materials or designing organizations or buildings, that kind of adaptation in response to what is going on around us um, is really important. And one of the great things in nature is it has all these feedback loops. Mm. And I think tapping into those in a really genuine way, it's not just consultation to tick a box, it's genuinely listening in our case to a place really understanding what's going on what's really understanding what's going on in the workplace and a commitment to work with that mm -hmm. um and i think i guess in terms of exactly what that might look like i mean i'm sure loads of people working in the built environment have worked on kind of regeneration schemes and that word regenerate mm -hmm. i think has been lost a little bit because nature ultimately regenerates from within it's not about stuff coming into a place and plonking it in there <laughs> it's about responding to what's going on in that place already um there is we have these red lines on plans there's no red line when we go there in practice so i think just taking that example of regeneration it would be a shift from kind of outside in to inside out recognizing the porosity of the boundaries between where we are and and ultimately the system living system in that in that location that we're part of um so i think it it allows us to actually shift from that kind of linear way of looking at things to more of a place-based um approach and a great example which occurred to me when i was writing the article for you actually like when we look at meanwhile uses actually the reason some of those work well is it provides a space for Kind of young growth of adaptation of things trying out within the local community and the ones that work then go on and thrive and i think there's a really lovely way of looking at it not like it's not just the thing that we do because it's a space we need to fill for a few years actually how do we use that as part of a wider process to kind of listen to what's going on and respond to it and i think what comes out of it will be so much more beautiful that's lovely and it's like little young saplings isn't it you put four or five in a little thing and then you know one will grow because it's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah to go use your metaphor kind of idea yeah. um, so what obviously you talk about also an index you know what what is an index and and um, how do people use it and why is it important yeah so it's the most sustainable workplace index um which we've developed within orientate so where that came from, I just to quote two stats. There's a, a report by Bain and Company in 2017. I suspect not a huge amount's changed. And what that found was that 98% of sustainability initiatives failed to deliver. Um, in the months of COP in Glasgow, there was a report that found I think 90% of emissions targets and work on emissions isn't robust. So there's this huge stats about, like as I said at the beginning, like we're kind of talking about it but we're just not doing it and a lot of that for me is about the human factors and we need to reduce that so that's really where the index came from so again to kind of use a, a, a nature-based metaphor i think sometimes what we can fall into the trap of in organizations <clears throat> so there's whether it's a, a training program or a strategy we think of those as seeds we kind of come along and we think right if we scatter these seeds <laughs> they will just grow but I think the stats show that they don't always and they don't lead to genuine change. 
So whilst we keep doing that and just putting things on stony ground, we will continue to get that those stats. So that's where the index comes in, really, because I think if we're going to see that change, we need to think about more the soil. So the soil in an organisation is it's the culture, it's the relationships, it's our purpose, it's our meaning, it's all the stuff that allows things to to grow. So what the index does is it helps us understand it. It helps us prepare the ground for kind of future seeds so we can select the right ones. So that's where the index comes in. So ultimately it's a human centric measure of sustainability. Um, it is based around motivation and motivation theories. So There's 40 years of evidence that that approach that backs it up. Because my view is that if people were motivated throughout an organization, we would not be getting those stats that I quoted at the beginning. So by understanding the factors affecting motivation, so levels of competence, levels of autonomy, how, how we connect with others within the organization, it can give us the insight that mean we actually understand our people and we can respond to what they need to step into more action on this and ultimately reduce those stats. So that's where the index comes in. It, it gives organizations an insight into the role of people culture um and how that is either frustrating or building motivation for sustainable change and climate change so what do you think um about biophilic design then <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah i mean so how, basically no i mean we, you can't you did touch on it just now but um how does it sit in in the um sustainability picture yeah so I think you mentioned it. So if we look at the term biophilic, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's the love of life, it's the love of nature, the love of everything that's living. So I guess the, the start point for me is what it means in terms of our why. So yeah. if we start from a place of loving life and everything that is alive, taking meaning from that, um, thinking about what that means for our values, for our purpose, and then learning to act on that, I think it will take us a hell of a long way forward and be and have integrity with that. So there's something around the why. There's something around the kind of how for me as well. So there's the kind of age old saying that we won't solve problems with the same thinking that created them. Yeah. So a lot of the problems we see in the world are a result of this kind of linear thinking, thinking we can, we have this endless system, this endless set of resources that we can exploit and not thinking about the connections between things so there's a big bit for me about how we think so within the context of sustainability it's complex it's really complex it's not easy like we haven't done it because it's not easy like we've been talking about <laughs> decades but it's really really complicated because you've got all these vested interests so i think biophilic design allows us to understand that complexity it gives us models of thinking and inspiration for how we can make sense of that and whether it's the river or sea like explore things in a different way I think it can then flow into how we design organizations differently so nature would never build an organization where you had a sustainability thing sitting over here it would be part of it um, <laughs> and the same on projects and the same on buildings materials um I think probably and one of the biggest things I've been working on lately, which really fascinates me, is thinking about it as an adaptation. Mm -hmm. So what if if we use biophilic design and, and this process of adaptation, I think it would be much more helpful because I think where we can sometimes get stuck, probably where we started off, was the sustainability and go, right, we're here and we need to get over here. And we set these big things, but we don't really think about and we go right well if we do this this and this we'll get there you know like, well it, it doesn't the world doesn't work like that so i think contextualizing what we do on sustainability is a process of adaptation i think can really help because what what we do when we adapt we don't worry about that we sit we stay where we are <laughs> we respond to what's going on around us through that kind of feedback we understand right well actually climate change is an issue social justice is an issue we need to respond to those things we don't other it over here we sit there and we do the work ourselves to adapt mm -hmm. as teams organizations we don't just buy something in or go right well if you tick this box things will change we've got to sit there and do the 
do the work of adapting what we do and how we do it to the world around us and for me that's really live at the moment in terms of how I want to start working with organizations and teams around this stuff is what what would it look like if we took that kind of biophilic um way of working through adaptation and really said let's sit in that space and and adapt what we do to respond to what's going on around us that's that's, that's great um as you say i mean nature adapts as well doesn't it nature adapts you know if there's if, if it's if it's a even if you look at tree rings and things you can see that they trees adapt when it's um when there's a drought or when there's a, a flood and everything so um yeah it's, it's a nice approach um i look forward to finding out more and how you how you grow and develop how you grow and develop that here we go <laughs> <laughs> um before I ask you the final question, uh, Jamie, and I, I could I could chat to you for ages, so you know, just be prepared on Wednesday when I see you. Um, so, um, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, I guess one thing I just I guess wanted to acknowledge this, like what you're doing, because I think one of the things we kind of need to do in this whole journey is we need these spaces for exploration and for discussion and for kind of this working out in the open through conversation and I think this kind of the image I always get of some of these things is actually like you've got this the, the places where stuff happens is at this intersection this meeting point between different things coming together working at the edges of kind of the, the mainstream but not too far away that people can't connect with it so I think just yeah, I think there's a really important role for these sorts of conversations and this, these kind of creating these spaces to explore this sort of work because it allows us to collectively explore what the opportunities are coming out of it as well. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm hugely, hopefully, <laughs> passionate about how we can start to bring these things into the workplace, the built environment. So, and and as I kind of said, I love collaboration. So again, if there's any listeners out there who um, are really interested to explore this work do get in contact um and then yeah in terms of the index I and mean, yeah if, if you're struggling to get engagement with your people if you're trying to set something off on you um on a kind of really firm ground then you need that insight then again do give me a call because um we're really excited to be exploring kind of how we can add to like, this insight to how organizations work in a more human-centric way that's wonderful so Jamie final question <laughs> uh, if you could paint and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you're saying here um, <laughs> if uh, if you could uh, paint the world with a magic brush of biophilia what would it look like so I had to think about this when I was on my walk this morning in in the woods and probably where it went where it started with this was this love of life and I'd be walking around and I would sense this kind of love of life and this sense that I think it was Jonathan Porritt, one of the things he said was one of our biggest challenges is to rediscover our connection and reconnect with nature. So I think had that world been painted in biophilia, we would have really reestablished our connection with nature. And given my kind of focus on the kind of human aspect of that, there was something about the heart and there was something about the head that kind of came through when I was thinking about it. So I think in terms of the heart bit, I've probably talked about it a bit already, but this kind of, I would, I would be able to see in people this love of life and this kind of depth of connection to what is going on around, but that wouldn't just be at weekends, which I think happens at the moment. That would, you would, that would be visible as people walk through the doors of the office or open their computers. It'd be visible in everything they did and it'd be really aligned to their values and how they behave. And we would have learned to work in a way that's integrated with that and has integrity with it. So there's something about the heart. I think the other thing I'd, I'd see is a kind of head bit. So that wonderful Gregory Bateson quote, and he kind of said, I guess to paraphrase it, was that a number of the problems that we have in the world are a result of the difference between how nature works and how we think. 
so that plays that kind of living systems piece so i'd be able to see these decisions that really were coming from a place of understanding the complexity of life and being inspired and connected to it in terms of how we work where we work what we do and then what i kind of thought about was i was like, right i really want to try and think about a practical example of this <laughs> um in terms of what it might look like and i don't know you, i'm sure you've probably seen it the kiss the ground documentary so you definitely watch it um it's really it's really beautiful but there's this image in the kiss the ground documentary there's this farmer in the states and he's a regenerative farmer and he's standing on the edge of his land so looking to the right he's got this kind of largely quite barren really struggling land that his neighbor owns and that's basically farmed in a way that just works the way with the financial subsidies and it's really there's no life and then you've got his way of looking at it and what you see there is you see the heart and the head so you see his head in terms of the way he's done it it comes from a really detailed understanding of the soil how it works how it interacts with animals with plant life and then you see this kind of heart place as well in terms of like he loves what he does and he goes around talking about it and so I think that's a kind of the perfect example for me of this shift that if we could get this shift in our hearts and our heads in terms of where that comes from, how we think, I'd want us all to be living <laughs> in that in that kind of thriving regenerative farm, um, yeah, that, that he was doing rather than the kind of yeah the the slightly uh, arid, struggling bit, which is the sense I get probably a lot of the time when I look at the news. <laughs> um, so that's probably what it would look like if it had been painted in by earlier. Thank you for listening to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast.